but we're as good enough. But you know what? We shouldn't be surprised. We really shouldn't be surprised because look, if we look back in history, and I've got you a note there under under paragraph A, one uh, A. If you look back to the Bible times, so the ancient world, look at Egypt, and then look at Assyria, and then look at Babylon, and then look at Persia, and then look at Greece, and then look at Rome. Exact same thing happened every time. They would uh, they would get uh, infiltrated with the truth. Uh, that back then it was one God and rather than a lot of false gods and a lot of uh, idol worship with false gods. And they would get on the right page, so to speak, spiritually speaking. And then what would happen? Well, if it, one thing would lead to another, the culture, the culture declined. And the next thing you know, they were wicked and evil. Wicked and evil. Every one of those cultures ended up that way. Some of them really big. Uh, Egypt, you know, Moses had to get the people out of there. Um, Babylon, Babylon was so bad that, uh, well, you remember when Habakkuk prayed, Lord, why are you letting all these Israelites, my kindred, sin like this? Why don't you do something? Are you listening? Are you awake, God? And God said, hold on, Habakkuk, I'm awake. I know exactly what's going on. Just you hold on. You'll see what I'm about to do, and you're not going to believe it. We're going to let an army come in there and take over you, you guys. And he said, who? And, uh, and God said, well, Babylon's going to come. And they're going, to, they're going to tear the place up. And he said, Babylon, they're worse than we are. <laughs> and God says, yeah, I know. But it's time, it's time we got your attention. And so, you know, the city of Jerusalem was burned down. The, the, the temple was burned down. They were taken uh, captive. And uh, for 70 years, they were in, in Babylon. And uh, so that, that cycle repeats itself. Thank God uh, the king uh, Dur, uh, Darius, I believe his name was, in, in Persia, decided to let the Jews go back home, those that wanted to, to go back to Jerusalem, and so some did. And they rebuilt the temple. They rebuilt the temple. They rebuilt the temple. That's key. That's, revi that's church revitalization. You know? <laughs> uh, that's growing a healthy church. They started with nothing, really, there. Um, that's almost replanting a church, isn't it? But uh, I'm going to call it revitalization. See, it happened as far back as then, and before then, actually. And so uh, it's uh, there's no we shouldn't be surprised. And then if you look at if you look at the book of Revelation, which we've been doing at ten o'clock on Sunday morning, we're not surprised, are we? No, this it, it was forecast, it was prophesied uh, that it would happen. If you read your Bible, you know the end times what's going to happen. In fact, I, I see earthquakes in South Carolina a lot now, don't you? Does that get your attention? Yeah, killings and looting and 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 no regard for authority. Um, that gets my attention, and when I see the people just just uh, burning down buildings, <laughs> their own buildings in some cases, and not getting arrested for it, that that gets my attention. That 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 boy that smacks of evil and wicked in, in last days. And so uh, somebody said that uh, Antichrist is already here. He may be. He's not uh, been uh, announced yet. There'll probably be a, a big deal about that. But he hadn't. We don't know who that is, and he may be, or at least his his. Uh, Power seems to be here. Uh, his uh, his influence seems to be here. But at any rate, it, we should not be surprised. Same thing in the Book of Revelation: wickedness, evil, sin, reliance on Satan and self. What? Who did uh, Adam and Eve want to rely on? Themselves. Who did they not want to rely on? God. They didn't, they, they said, God, we'll do it your way. Except give us a little break. Let us just do that one thing on our own. Let us have our selfish way on one thing. Well, we have turned that into a litany of selfish things, haven't we? We all now want to do our thing. Don't diss me is the is the nomencl is the common expression in schools and in culture and everywhere else. Don't don't uh, don't uh, uh, ridicule me. I'm gonna do things my way and I don't care what you say. I understand they've got it in schools, but it's rampant in schools. Uh, who would ever thought? You'd have to have a police, at least one, and hope, and, and even probably ten or twelve policemen on campus at a school, at a high school or an elementary school, to protect the kids. Who would have ever thought of it? I would, you know, these folks are some of you are younger than I am. Y'all didn't have that in school, and you probably didn't think about that. And and we brought guns to school when I was a kid. I had my rifle uh, in the back of the pickup truck up on the uh, thing over the back glass. And we'd, uh, you know, it was nothing to bring in, go out at recess or go out before school or after school and look at the newest shotgun. I remember when Browning's uh, Auto Fires came out. Boy, we had those all over the parking lot there for a whole semester. People were looking at them. $500 shotgun. I said, man, 
$500 for a shotgun. I couldn't afford the, the shells for it, you know, much less the, the gun. But the, different days, and it's a different culture, and that's it, but we shouldn't be surprised. Well, and you know this history, but I'm going to just refresh our memory with it. What happened in the first century AD? God sent his son Jesus uh, to be born, live, minister, die, and rise again, so that to, and ascend into heaven and send his Holy Spirit to reside uh, in us, those of us who trusted in him. What was his method? Now, this is critical. If we're going to look at a method for revitalization today, why don't we look back to what Jesus did? His method was acting on the word of God, his father, through the power of the spirit within. He was the spirit of God. So that was the method of operation then, God's word uh, and God's power. And that's what changed the culture. That's what changed in Acts chapter 2. That's what stimulated it. He laid the, uh, the plans when he was alive for believers to get together. Somebody get Matthew chapter 16 real quick. Matthew 16. He laid the plans for assembly of believers to come together. And uh, he, uh, he even laid the plans for who was going to uh, begin the thing. The very first church service. He already laid out the plans for it. Matthew chapter 16 is said in verse 18. You remember, you probably remember this, uh, this quote. Oh, <laughs> that's Cordioli. <laughs> well, <laughs> don't know how to do that. Uh, and I, this is Jesus talking. And I say unto you that thou art Peter. He was talking to Peter. And he said, upon this rock, I, uh, I, I will build my church. I'm sure that's what it says. I can't read, read it. Um, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Are we in a place now where the gates of hell are trying to prevail against the church? You betcha. Will it happen? No, it won't. Jesus knew all about that. He knew it was going to be tried. And uh, he said, Peter, you're not going to believe this, old boy, but you're going to start the thing for me. And Peter probably at that point in his last, yeah, the old impetuous freak Peter, you know. Yeah, that's me, Lord. I'm, I'm in. I'm all in, Father. <laughs> Just count on me, Jesus. I'll be there. And uh, and so, and Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen and still, and still picked him. There's hope for all of us. <laughs> picked him to, to uh, leave the first church service. And uh, then he gave him some more uh, orders before, uh, in addition to that, to Peter. And uh, boy, uh, Pat, you got your uh, Matthew, go to Matthew 28, Pat. Um, and so he gave him some more orders before he ascended. He said, Boys, I'm getting ready to leave you. I've told you that for you uh, for three years now, but I couldn't stay here. I told you why I came, and you know why I came, and now you know that I'm gonna leave. And I suppose you're gonna be lonely, and I suppose you're starting to wonder, Well, how are we gonna leave this thing without you, Lord? And so he says, I'm not gonna leave you by yourself, comfortless. He says, I'm gonna give you my spirit. I'm going to send you my spirit to those that believe. Pat, you got it, 28 verses 18 to 20. What did he tell them to do? Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. All right, let's take that last part of that uh, passage first, and we'll get back to the other later. Uh, he said, Lo, I'm with you always. How could he say that? What, don't you think that thought that was strange uh, on first blush? Wait a minute now, Lord. You know, that wine you've been drinking may be, far, may be laid up for a while, maybe firm a little bit. How are you going to do that? You're going to be gone, but yet you're going to be with us always. How is that going to happen? I'm sure some of them wondered. They had heard, but some of them wondered. And so he made it perfectly plain that he, I'm going to send you the comforter. That's what he told them. And I'll give some more instructions here in just a second on how he did that. In fact, Luke 24, 49, and I know this is old stuff to you, but we need to get this so that we have the context of where we're going in, in 2022. We're not going anywhere new, folks, is what I'm trying to tell you. This plan was laid out. 2,000 years ago, and before then, it was laid out long before that, but it was put in force and worked. I mean, big time worked uh, 2,000 years ago. Luke 24, 49. And boy, I tell you what, I, glasses are a blessing and a curse. 24, 49 must be on the next page. 
send the promise of my father upon you. There it is. I'm going to send the promise of my father. And my father gave me that promise when I made it to you. When I told you that I'm not leaving you, uh, I will be with you also, always. I always listen to my father. My father told me to say that, just like we listen to the father. And we know what he tells us. He, Jesus was saying, I'm getting these instructions from my father, boys. And just like he told me, he said, uh, I'm not ever going to leave you. And he said, he made, I made you a promise because of that. Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem after I'm gone until you be endued with the power from on high. Now, these disciples had to take him for his word. They'd seen him do miracles. They'd seen him heal the sick and, and uh, the blind and everything else. And he knew if he said something that it, it was going to happen. And when he said, this is a promise of my father, they had no doubt. They had no doubt something big was going to happen in Jerusalem. So in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, what did they do? What did they do next? As soon as Jesus arose from the dead, what, uh, and ascended into heaven, I mean, what did, uh, what did the disciples do? They went to Jerusalem, didn't they? Did they, 120 of them got together in a room. Is that not right? 120 got together in a room, and the first part of that Acts just sort of reviews Luke wrote both of those, and I think he forgot what he had written in the in the end of Luke, so he said it again in the first of the uh, Acts there, and he says in verse 1-8, uh, he says, but ye shall receive power, this is Jesus, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye will do what with that power? You'll, mm -hmm, go ahead. Shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem. Uh huh. And in all Judea. Okay. And in Samaria. Okay. And unto the uttermost part of the, the earth. The uttermost parts of the earth. Now, when we think about the uttermost parts of the earth, we think about uh, uh, we think about out of Mongolia or something like this. But these little boys didn't know anything about Mongolia, but to them, right there where they were, Jerusalem. And then Judea, and then uh, Samaria, and then that—that that was their world. They knew there was a Europe, and but, but they didn't know much about it. Uh, and uh, so the Asia Minor, they knew there was Asia. They knew about that, but they didn't know much about it. their world. Was real small compared to it is today. But the point is, they were to go everywhere. They were to go everywhere. I think we're going to find the same is true for us to go everywhere. So that was the plan. That was what uh, Jesus told them. Said, boys. When I pass away, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm not going to leave you alone. I want you to go to Jerusalem. I want you to wait. I want you to, to uh, be endued with power. Then I want you to take that power and go out and be my witnesses. This is the plan for the church that he was about to build. Very good. I would say it'd be a pretty good idea to do the same thing today. What do you think? Yeah. Okay. So he says, in, uh, what does his followers do? They went to Jerusalem. All 120 of them up. Oh, they began to pray. That's the first thing they did. Is that not right? Now, listen, folks, the church is getting ready to start. I mean, it's either the same day or the next day. The church is getting ready to start. And what are them boys in there doing? Praying. Praying. You think there may be a hint there or maybe something that we ought to do. And that's why I talked about prayer this past Sunday. Pray. Seek God's face. If we're doing his will, why don't we ask him to honor him and praise him and bless him, bless him because of it and then ask him to carry it out? Nothing wrong with that, is it? Ask him to execute it and stand back and watch. <laughs> Ain't no telling what's going to happen. What happened here? Well, you know the story. The Holy Spirit fell. They started, uh, they started uh, talking and everybody around them. And they were Jews. So this was Passover. And so there were Jews from all over the place there for this special event. And there were no windows back then, no air conditioning units running, none of that. So they could hear everything when they were on the outside of that building. They could hear those 120 in there, everything that was going on. And those guys, those Jews that were there were from different parts of the country. So they have a different dialect. They don't all speak the same language. 
uh, just like well, the folks in Charleston don't speak the same language as we do. You know, they see around the house board down there, read the stuff pepper and stuff like that. <laughs> and we don't say it that way. And and so they, uh, the the guys outside that had the different said, "Listen, what what is that? It doesn't sound like." But we know what they're saying. We know what they're saying. There was uh, there was speaking in tongues. It, of course, is a story there. And so uh, they were filled with the Holy Spirit as promised. Well, what happened next? Peter was in that crowd. Peter was the one who, uh, you know, got a sword and cut a fill, fell his ear off. And he was the impetuous one. He was the one who said, not me, Lord. I'm not going to cave in on you. No, no, no. And uh, Jesus said, before the cock crows three times, oh boy, you're going to be in big, in big trouble. And it, and it turned out to be that same man who we would say, how could he be close to God? That man who Jesus had picked up. How do we know we haven't come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Peter didn't know it, but look what happened. I, I, I believe every person in this room is here tonight because uh, God wants us to be here. There's a reason for this. We have been placed here for this time in his plan. You wouldn't be here if it weren't true because we're about to execute his plan. There is no doubt about it. And you're here. That just tells me that you're, you're here because of, uh, of God's will and God's plan. Peter preached about Jesus and 3,000 people got saved. You know that story. Somebody's got Acts chapter 2. Read the 40 through 47. It's kind of lengthy, but that's all right because it sets up what they did next in the church. Anybody got it? Yeah. All right, go. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this unforced uh -huh. generation. Yeah. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things in common. sermon what a what a revival uh what a uh, i could preach right there for, for the rest of my life in those verses that's just awesome right there that's not only good for preaching that's good for hearing and listening and adhering to as well the uh the uh the the uh hold on a minute you know you need to say i can't talk and think anymore okay. um so she said she just read what happened there they um they began uh, a church service, didn't they? That's pretty good. That's a pretty good crowd to start a church with. Three thousand. That's not bad. <laughs> but that's what they did. They began. They became devoted to the apostles' doctrine. Uh, they they had Bible study. They had Wednesday night Bible study. Um, they uh, fellowshiped. They had uh, uh, socials and trip took trips together and had a, a, a Mother's Day banquets together and all kinds of things together. They brought their needs to, to the church. Uh, somebody had figs and but needed apples. Hey, man, I brought my figs, and, and you guys can have my figs. Anybody got any apple? Yeah, you brought some. Apple. Okay. And they would, they would take care of each other. They didn't necessarily uh, go out and sell everything, but they had things to sell, but they didn't sell. They exchanged them. They supplied one another's needs is what they did. That was the first government there ever was, that first welfare program right there in Acts chapter 2 was uh, the the, uh, the 3,000 supplying everybody's needs. And it worked, and it worked. And so they fellowship. They went and spread the gospel, I'm sure. There was discipleship going on. You remember, some of you probably remember when you were little bitty guys uh, in Sunday school, there was a song that, that we used to sing a good bit. We even had hand expressions. Pat does it with our grandchildren now, not this song, but she does Jesus Loves Me with the hand signals, you know. Well, you remember deep and wide, Deep and wide, there's a fountain flowing deep and wide. That's what these guys did. They went deep and they went wide. 
Now, there are people today that want to revitalize the church and they want to go real, real, real wide. They want a lot of butts in the seat, okay, <laughs> is the terminology for it. They don't give a rip, really, apparently, about how much spiritual maturity takes place. They just want a big crowd. And now they claim that people get saved that way, and they do. They do. I've seen it. Pat and I was a member, were members of a mega church at one time, and I saw people getting saved, and, and that's great. I also know there was no spiritual maturity going on. They, they went real wide, but they didn't go very deep at all. They were about a one inch deep, 10 miles wide. Okay. That was the problem. That is the problem. That, you know, the Southern Baptist kind of kind of did the same thing. Um, I remember back in the days when we had uh, Sunday night BTU Baptist Training Union, and that was the teaching time. That's when we learned how to be disciples. Sunday morning was the preaching time when people got saved, and then they'd go on Sunday night and learn how to be a disciple, and then they'd go out and win people at school. Talk about, I remember at school when I was a kid, I didn't get saved then, but I remember kids talking about the Lord, and they were uh, people who went to Sunday morning and, and, and Sunday night services. They learned about the, uh, the Lord and, the, and discipleship and all that. And so the churches then became deep and wide. Then the, the Southern Baptists decided to do away with a lot of that. You know, down uh, we went Baptist Training Union, who knows what all else. And we started paying for it. We started suffering because of it, frankly. And so I tell people to some degree, it's our own fault. We have abandoned the, the plan that worked. And uh, the, to that degree, it's our fault. But at any rate, God knew all about that too, deep and wide. Others want to be real deep. Man, they want the healing to take place right here in front of uh, everybody on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. The lame to walk, the blind to see, and, 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 and who knows how much of that's really true. It's sensational. You see it on TV, and then you hear that the same guy got arrested for false advertising and for uh, they find people in the back with microphones in their ears, and the whole thing's rigged and all this kind of mess. And so it's a power grab is, is what it is. Uh, you know, we in this culture want either money or power. Boy, if we get both, we're hard to guard. And uh, I hate to say it, but some of that is power grabbing. Uh, others of it is it's real. I believe people can get healed. I believe it all. In fact, I wouldn't pray for people to be healed if I didn't believe God could heal. But God can heal. God can heal. Not Benny, Billy Bob or any of those other boys, but God can heal. I believe that. Uh, and uh, so that's what was happening. Now, was there any results? Were there any uh, uh, long-term results? of this plan in other words was it a one night stand was it a flash in the pan was it just a, a one and done um, or did it sort of perpetuate with itself acts chapter 6 verse 7 this is a little later in the game now acts chapter 6 verse 7 and the word of god increased in other words people were learning the scripture learning that they didn't have a, a thomas nelson bible back then but they, uh, but they heard preaching. They heard the apostles. They knew. They talked with the apostles who had uh, known Jesus and walked with him. And the word of God increased. It became uh, like I said at school. People started talking about Jesus in my high school and college. I mean, a grammar school because of uh, the, the church they went to. The word of God increased when I was a kid. The word of God increased here to the point. Verse uh, chapter six, verse seven says. And the number of the disciples multiplied. Well, isn't that fun? Did you tell you kidding? As the word of God increased, the number of disciples increased. If you look at a disciple as a student, then or a pupil, then that's exactly what was happening. If you're teaching me about the Lord and I'm listening and learning, I'm a disciple. I just haven't put it in force yet, maybe. But the word of God was increasing. The, the number of disciples were multiplying. It didn't say church attendance. It didn't say membership. It didn't say uh, people in the seat. It said disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Multiplication is the name of the game, folks. We can add uh, till the cows come home and never achieve a big number. But if we multiply, we get there a whole lot faster. Because you're a multiplication. You, the Amway had a good plan. They had a scriptural plan. That's what that was. That was a scripture. In fact, the guys that started Amway are Christians. I think they're both still living. I'm not sure. But uh, Nancy DeVos, okay, is in that family. Uh, she was in, in Trump's administration. Uh, Rich DeVos was one of them. Now, who was the other guy? Van. Uh, yeah, Van Andel. Yep, yep, yep. From Minnesota, I believe. 
somewhere up Michigan. that way. Michigan, yeah. Michigan, yeah. Godly people. They know I donated just tons and tons of money to godly things. And uh, they uh, their plan was to uh, reach one and then have that one reach five and have those five reach five more and those five reach five more. And you know the game, sponsorship and all that. Well, uh, I, I'm not going to poo poo Amway. That worked for some, but but uh, discipleship works every time. That works with the Word of God because I've got a product that that, that is uh, absolutely real. There's no question about it, and I don't have to I don't have to sell it. The Holy Spirit sells it for me. The Holy Spirit sells it for me. All I got to do is just put it out there, and they'll take it. Some will, some won't. The ones that won't, tough stuff. The ones that do, praise God. Put it out there. So. <laughs> Go and evangelize and disciple. Give them enough discipleship to know how to sell the soap, as the Amway boy says. Okay, know know a little bit about what's going on. Have a have some sort of idea of how to what they should say. Um, so they became deep and wide. And verse uh, Acts chapter six verse seven proves that. I haven't gotten the first Timothy yet, and probably won't tonight. But that's all right. Y'all y'all gonna come back next week anyway. <laughs> They realized what was happening. The culture was changing. The culture was changing. Acts chapter 17, verses 5 and 6. Let's see what that says. This is on a little later on in life here now. In chapter 17, verses 5 and 6. Uh, but the Jews, which believed not. Okay, there were some, there were, the whole place was Orthodox Jews. I mean, everybody there just about was Orthodox Jews. The only people that worked were Gentiles. They were other than Orthodox Jews. You know the story about the Orthodox Jews. They were a member of Abraham's seed. They believed that they were chosen. Most of them believed they didn't need Jesus as a Messiah, as a Savior. They just wanted him as a ruler. They wanted him to come and take over and defeat Rome so that they could have the lion's share of the land and the money and all the other stuff. And they wanted the politics and the, and the wealth and everything. And um, that's, that was their Messiah, was politics and wealth. Well, when Jesus came on the scene, he, they found out pretty quickly he wasn't here for that. He was here to win souls, to bring them to his kingdom. And uh, some of the Jews were converted. Well, it became a lot of animosity. The uh, old Jews, the Orthodox Jews who didn't get converted, took exception to that. And they started uh, finding ways to persecute or to uh, cause trouble with the converted Jews. Uh, so much so that there was a crowd called the Dispora Jews. The Jews got... Uh, they got overrun and had to leave town and they, and they spread out all over the place, which ended up being a great thing because when the converted Jews who had the gospel and were saved spread out all over everywhere, guess what they did? They took the gospel with them and they preached it everywhere then, not just in back in Jerusalem where they were getting beat up. And so you had an evangelism explosion, didn't you? God planned that too, didn't he? He allowed them to be persecuted so they would go out. So they would go out and spread the gospel. What a savior. What a God. Man, that guy is sharp now, right? Rich DeVos got nothing on him. <laughs> and so that's what that's what happened. And, and uh, the Gentiles even. Now, the Gentiles didn't have quite the, the problem to deal with that the Jews did. But still, the Gentiles were ostracized, too. The Gentiles were looking for, what are you Italians doing? Y'all are crazy. You're supposed to be Roman soldiers, man. You're supposed to be helping us take over everywhere. And then you are caved in and went to the other side. Traitor. You know, they got persecuted. Surely they did. The Gentiles did. The Greeks came along and were there with their enlightenment and, and really uh, and started making the, uh, the Christians feel bad. But at any rate, they began to become persecuted is what we're saying there. But look at what happened. There's an old boy in there named Jason. And I don't know whether you know Jason or not. Uh, chapter 17, verse 5 and 6. Listen to this, and maybe even 7. It says, but the Jews which believed not, in other words, they were still orthodox. They had not been converted. I can't help but think of my dad, and Paul's there for a minute. My dad was a devout Christian. He loved the Lord with all his heart. Not educated, not educated at all. And sometimes they get stuff a little bit wrong. But his heart was right. I never heard my dad use the word saved. Never. Never in all my life when I was growing up. But he used the word converted every time. There's where it came from, right there. The Jews were converted. They had been Orthodox Jews. Now they're converted Jews. They believe in the Messiah for the real thing. And so they were converted. And, and you and I, I have, were converted too, weren't we? Absolutely, I was converted. 
the uh, the Jews which believed not moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. In other words, they go get some help to, to defeat and persecute the Christian Jews and gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason. Now, it doesn't say much about Jason there, but obviously Jason, if all these uh, hypocrites and, and, uh, and Orthodox Jews and bringing in, I uh, wonder where, where that concept came from. I, I think I remember seeing in some of these protests and bringing people from out of town. Uh, is there any wonder about that? It's, it's biblical, y'all, <laughs> for the wrong reason. <laughs> they brought they brought help from out of town, real renegades and bums and no counts, <laughs> and uh, and tried to tried to persecute the Christians. Well, this old boy named Jason, I think old Jason was a good old boy, but he got saved. I think that was probably what happened. Jason got saved, and boy, did he get persecuted. And when they found them not, they drew, they couldn't find the guy, the Jews. To the Christians, they they drew Jason, they grabbed Jason because they knew Jason was a part of it, and certain brethren, and to the rulers of the city, they took Jason down to county council, crying and said, "Look what these people have done to us! They have turned the town, the world, upside down." And it had, then that's exactly what happened. They had turned the world upside down. Those Christians uh, who were saved, they believed in the Messiah, they believed in God, but the, the, uh, the uh, culture had changed. The culture had changed, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, and the persecutors, the Orthodox Jews that didn't get saved, along with the Gentiles who hadn't been saved, sort of took over. There was a power str a struggle. And the culture became more wicked. And so it flopped upside down, and bless my soul, what happened? Jason and his boys turned it upside down again. The upside's now down, the downside's back up. Do you get it? That's what we want to do. I went all the way through that to get to that. That's what we want to do. We want to turn this community and this state and this nation and this world upside down. That's what we want to do. We want to take what's up right now in the eyes of most of them and put it down. And take what we stand for, which in their view is down, and put it up. Okay? We want to turn the world upside down. That's our goal. That's our plan. And you know what? If we explode with evangelism, if we multiply, if we do the Amway thing, if you will, if we, if we go get one, and he gets two or three, and he gets discipled and multiplies and multiplies and multiplies, we can turn this world upside down. Will it be as big a crowd as it was that we thought it was going to be now? Bible is plain that it's going to be a smaller remnant. In fact, some of them now who claim that they trust the Messiah and, that they, and all that, we'll, we'll find out there's, there's some not-so's in there somewhere, but uh, it'll be a smaller crowd, but that's all right. I'm going to be in that smaller crowd, and uh, I'll be tooting my horn, and I'll be listening for it to blow. You know, somebody else got a trumpet too, and I'll be, <clears throat> I'll be listening for that. So um, they, how did they do that? How did they turn the world upside down? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> They practice what uh, Carol read back there in church uh, Church uh, practice, uh, the, the devotion, the fellowship, the praying, the assembling of themselves together in, in worship, not only at the temple, but also door to door and house to house. They had, they had little uh, church groups. It was called an oikos, O-I-K-O-S in the Greek. It, uh, it was a, um, a group of like-minded family and friends who gathered. They gathered together and they had church. The very first small group, if you will, was, was an oikos in the, in the Greek. And so they gathered together and they worshiped God at home, uh, house to house, and they also did it um, a, a, in the temple. And I believe that passage says, at least there's one passage in, nearby there, that said they found favor in the sight of all. They found favor. When they were doing it God's way, those that they approached, even if they didn't accept Christ, they found favor with them. They were allowed to come in, and they were allowed to present the gospel. Pat and I ran a bus route in the 70s uh, and 80s uh, for a long time, and that culture at that time had slipped. The, the, uh, in, my, in my era, when I was growing up, mamas and papas went to church and took the kids with them. But in the late 70s and the early 80s, kid, uh, parents started staying home. But they knew they had the presence of the Holy Spirit in them enough to know 
uh, around them enough to know that those kids needed to be in church. And so all you had to do almost is ride around and look for a tricycle or a sled or a, or a, a playground piece of equipment, something, swing set, whatever, dirty diaper, anything, and stop and go up and say, excuse me, I'm Tom, I'm from Joe Blow Church down the road here at Baptist Temple. And I just wondered, we have a bus that comes through here on Sunday morning, yada, 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 yada. You, you've heard of our GA, yeah, I've heard of it. Well, you know, I'd love to stop and, and uh, take the kids with us. What, what, don't, you wouldn't have any objection to that, would you? No, that'd be a great idea. And churches flourished with that concept for a while. And guess what? Some of those kids are grown now, serving the Lord. Amen. Oh, look at there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're not by yourself, sister. This, this room's got some other folks in there the same way. And, uh, and so praise God for that. That petered out too because of the culture. You go down and you find a swing set in somebody's yard and stop and walk up there uh, at night and say, hey, I want to talk to you a minute. And the coroner will be uh, there pretty soon. <laughs> You know, uh, the next door neighbor will have to call the coroner one. So, uh, and you know, you can't, you can't blame them to some degree because it's such a wicked world. I wouldn't let, yeah, I, I don't let anybody in my house because I know who it is and I make sure one of us has got a gun on us. Amen. Amen. I walked out, uh, digressing for just a moment because I'm going to have to stop here shortly. Anyway. Uh, last year, I guess it was, I got up one morning and got up. Five or ten minutes after Pat, for some strange reason, she said, you need to go out in the yard. She said, there's something laying out there. And I said, laying out there? And she said, yeah. I said, well, okay. And so I piddled around there and got some clothes on and opened the door and looked. Sure enough, I saw something laying out there. And uh, But I didn't know what it was. It kind of looked like an old blanket or an old, uh, I thought it was something that fell off a truck going down the highway. We live on 24. And it's not uncommon for stuff to fall off a truck. And, and end up in my yard. And so I thought, well, that's just something that fell off a truck, but I guess I better go out there and see what it is. And so uh, Pat was standing at, at the front door and I began to I walk out there and I, I didn't have my gun. I turned and said, Pat, you got your gun? She said, yeah. I said, all right. So I, I uh, just walked on out. Well, as I got a little closer and looked, the, the thing, the bundle started moving a little bit. I said, hmm. And uh, then I saw a foot hanging at the bottom of that bundle. I said, Pat, come here, please. <laughs> and she came out and said, let me hold it. And she gave me the gun. So then I felt uh, like talking to the bundle. And I, and I made the bundle take the top off. And it was a guy, and I had no idea what he was, you know, uh, was doing there. Um, but uh, when I tried to get him up, to get him out, he kept, uh, trying to uh, reach in his pants for something. I said, oh, Lord, he's got a knife or a gun or something. And the guy's probably dazed, and there's no telling what he's going to do. And I sure don't want to kill him while be in my own yard. You know, and I'm thinking, I, somebody got to do something. And I said, what am I going to do? And I said, I, I said, I made him put his hands up and, and do spread eagle against a tree, a big old tree, a pecan tree we got there in the front yard. So here I got this guy who's half out of his mind, and he's wanting to get his hands in his pocket, in his pants. Doing this right here, and I said, now what am I going to do? <laughs> <laughs> and about that time, I looked, and God sent a deputy sheriff, off-duty deputy sheriff, coming down the highway. And I'm sure that deputy sheriff looked and said, what in the world is that dude doing? <laughs> That's a funny way to get pecans. <laughs> and so uh, he stopped. And it didn't take him long to figure out what was happening. And, and uh, the guy didn't have a gun or a knife. He had drugs in his pocket. He didn't want anybody talking about drugs, obviously. But they hold him off. And, and so, uh, but you see, that's the culture we live in. And if that guy had come, I mean, Pat will tell you, somebody knocks on my door at night, there's, there's some explaining to do, Lucy, before you get in my house. Uh, and then you under scrutiny <laughs> for a while. And, uh, and I'm talking about Mr. Smith and Mr. Wesson type scrutiny, okay? And I don't blame you for doing the same thing. So that's, that's what was happening here. The culture had certainly changed. And, um, and there was need for turning the town upside down. I'm going to just stop right there. I think it looks like it's about 5 till. Is that right? No. What time is it? 5 till. Yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to keep us. I am one of the few preachers I know that really don't like to go over time. I mean, I don't like to. I, there's, I guess I've been, in, I've been in enough long-winded preacher's sermons to say, when is that guy ever going to quit? I got this, I got his point 20, 30 minutes ago. Yeah. You know, I got things to do, Rev, hurry up. <laughs> but uh, so I'm conscious of that, and uh, so I don't want to do that. So we'll just quit right there. But you can look at that handout and see what, where we're going from here. We're going to see how they did it. 
And then we're going to summarize that what we said here, uh, just sort of an introduction to what's going on. And then we're going to start with the book of First Timothy. I'm going to take almost uh, verse for verse, chapter uh, uh, line by line, chapter by chapter, uh, exegetically uh, teach um, the book of First Timothy, just like we're doing in Revelation in the mornings, Sunday mornings. Uh, we, we teach it uh, as it pops up. Whatever pops up is what we teach. And so First Timothy, we're going to find that the First Timothy is an excellent book. So is Second Timothy and Titus on what a healthy church looks like, should look like. You know, I can't ask somebody to imitate something they've never seen or never heard about. That's it. That's almost impossible because you don't know what to do. But if I want to imitate something, then I'll go and do a little research and I'll find out what what it looks like. That I'm then I got a halfway chance of getting there. And then when you got God on your side, you you, you all the way. But you know what to pray for until eventually that way, and what to do and all that sort of thing. So the book of First Timothy, we're going to tear it apart, digest it, and spit it back out. And uh, and also the second Timothy also to some of it, we'll skip around a little bit in second Timothy and Titus, but Titus especially has got the rules for the uh, for the deacon and the and the bishop, and, and we'll go through those in in uh, first Timothy. We won't have to go back through a uh, second Timothy. We won't have to go back through them again in Titus, but but we're going we're going to digest those, and we'll have some little books along the way to talk about um, some pastors. I've got tons of books at home on pastors that have, that have. Uh, been right, uh, been right there where they took over a church that was poor, unhealthy, and and took them 20 years to get where they are today. But they 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 they're not ashamed and not uh, unwilling to tell about the growing pains and uh, what they did to uh, to become healthy. So that's where we're headed, folks. Uh, I'm not here to beat up on anybody. We're not here to claim that we're um, that we're unhealthy uh, to the point that uh, that you know we want to be. Uh, put it on the Medicaid uh, welfare list or any of uh, spiritually speaking or any of that. It's not that at all. It's just that we're all unhealthy to some degree. We all are. And what makes an unhealthy church? Unhealthy members. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and so there you go. If uh, And I'm a member. And so I need to learn how to be more healthy if I want the body to be healthy. That's why I'm so slim and trim. I got such. I mean, better not go there. Never mind. No, don't, don't use that one. Don't you find another excuse? Find another reason. But that's where I'm headed. And and next week we'll take up uh, that in First Timothy and start a uh, verse for verse and word for word. Okay. It won't be just me running my mouth. Uh, then it'll be God running His mouth, and that's a good way to put it. Amen. Amen. Any uh, comments or questions? And and feel free. I got uh, I got all night. Some of these people got ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't buy green bananas, man. I, yes, ma'am. Uh, it was part, mostly the uh, the uh, most of the ones in the three thousand, uh, because that was they uh, everybody there. Uh, Peter preached, and three thousand were baptized, got saved, and were accepted Christ, and were baptized. Uh, and so they were members of the church at that point when it started talking about Acts chapter two, verse forty. They were members of the church. They had been baptized, and uh, and not baptized just by the Holy Spirit, but baptized. Uh, they, they didn't get dipped in the water, but they were members. And so, good question. But yeah, I would probably uh, suggest that there were some renegades in that three thousand who didn't play ball with the team, just like there are today. But the bulk of them did, and uh, and the hundred twenty were there too. Okay. So yes and yes. Good question. Others. Uh, okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for this uh, introduction. Thank you for history that we can look back on, that we can read and glean from the Word of God what's happened in the past in the very uh, situation that we're dealing with today in our culture. We can look back at the times that uh, that, that uh, it occurred in Egypt or in Rome or in uh, other places, and uh, we can apply the word of God. We can apply scripture knowing that it worked then and, and knowing that you don't uh, renege on promises. If you promise something, it comes to pass. And so Lord, teach us to, that. Teach us to love and to understand and to digest the word of God. And then teach us to pray. I pray, Father, that if we've forgotten this week to de designate a day to pray every time we eat and we still have time and that you'll do that. And then those that have already remembered, just continue to pray for 
uh, revitalization, pray for uh, the uh, growth spiritually, pray for uh, transformation in each one of us, uh, pray for healthy conditions, spiritually speaking, for each one of us, pray for the unction and the, uh, and the boldness to approach somebody even with the gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ. Give us the power to, to at least go to somebody and said, uh, and tell them that we understand their hurt and that we had the same hurt, but we found the answer. Give us the unction and the boldness and power to do that and to invite people to come and see uh, the real thing, not just a gimmick or an attraction, but come and see the power of God at work. I pray for that, for this church and churches like us all around this, this uh, town and, and uh, the city, that we indeed could uh, one day have the... Uh, the uh, county council say they turned the, the town upside down. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All righty. Well, you are dismissed, and we are done. Let me see here if I can turn this thing off. I edit that by the